and do my very best. Um, so I'm not trying to um, to get his um, to get his crown basically, so that he's on there. But there's also many others that I discuss. So yeah, um, this is also why I want to start with the acknowledgements. There's quite some people. Um, Dinia Jazawi, Natasha, I've seen her here. Um, Tom Gleason, Inge de Graaf from Freiburg, Mitra Hadjati, Ubum Kim, um, Till is also here. Isaac, obviously, thank you. Um, and many others who, in some way or the other, have contributed to uh, parts of that work. Yeah. So, today, um, I'm going to talk about mostly that paper that's fairly recent, and I'm not showing that to show off. But again, to make clear that this is a good paper, um, it was, he was postdoc with Tom Gleason and I came in somehow later and together we built that. And this is, a lot of the talk is going to be about, but also afterwards I would like to give some perspective on um, thoughts that I had while also working on this one. So let's start with thinking, um, with, with, with saying what I'll talk about for this talk, all things discharge. There's a lot of different discharges at the coast that you can talk about. Um, the talk is named terrestrial groundwater discharge. Here it says fresh submarine groundwater discharge, fresh SGD. And this is what I probably use most of the talk. And I kind of use the two um, synonymously um, without saying that you should. Um, so in this talk uh, today, I mostly talk about fresh submarine groundwater discharge um, and introduce something that's called near shore terrestrial groundwater discharge. So that near shore groundwater discharge would be groundwater discharge right above the um, high tide line. So per definition, not any more submarine, but it's also, it's not a stream, it's not a river. Um, so it's groundwater seeping to the coast right at the coast and then basically forming very small streams. Um, I'll not talk about recirculated submarine groundwater discharge. I don't say it's not important, not at all, but it's a completely, in my mind, very much different story. Um, and this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and then the coastal groundwater discharge here in this figure basically integrates submarine groundwater discharge and near shore terrestrial groundwater discharge. Um, and we'll hear most of those terms Throughout the, throughout the talk. So, terrestrial groundwater discharge. As many of you know it, can look like this. Um, this is for some years ago where we went scouting to the Warden Sea and looked for submarine springs. And as you can see, and as you are not surprised, you don't see anything um, because it's hard to spot them or to spot locations where groundwater discharges Till is an excellent groundwater discharge site spotter. There is one, and it looks like that. Um, so this is one regional example of how groundwater discharge, submarine, fresh submarine groundwater discharge can look like. Um, and it's difficult already to estimate how much water comes from that single spring, um, even at this point in time. If you think about how much water comes from this area, like in a year's time, that's even harder. And if you zoom out and think how much groundwater comes from, or fresh groundwater comes from this area, it's really tricky. Um, so this is kind of, then it really gets a challenge when you want to estimate how much groundwater comes from that area. So fresh submarine groundwater discharge um, from this area. And um, I've, given a lot of thought about extrapolating from those local studies and trying to get from the local scale to the global scale. Um, recently, Natasha, and I also saw Mark Henry here, um, he put a lot of effort in that and a lot of thought in that. And um, I, think, I think it challenges him, not because he's easily challenged, but because it's a big challenge to extrapolate from the local scale. So what we did there was to, um, to use a model approach to estimate the groundwater, fresh terrestrial groundwater discharge. I, I often just say groundwater discharge or submarine groundwater discharge is always fresh terrestrial submarine groundwater discharge. Please um, be, be patient. Please don't. 
Um, so the granular, to estimate granular discharge from a local, uh, from a global scale is best done at this point with models. And for that, we need a base area that we are interested in. So from where does the submarine groundwater discharge come? And in that case, we assume it's from the coastal catchments. Coastal catchments, and you see those lines in red, they are actually coastal catchments, would, um, would be catchments that do not drain into major rivers and lie directly at the coast. Now, if we zoom in to our current seminar location, um, Gothenburg, we all sit in Gothenburg. It's somewhere here, I think. Isaac, you can correct me if you like, but it's somewhere there. Um, so that would be coastal catchments in Denmark and southern Sweden. And you see um, how small they are, but obviously they are not really groundwater catchments. They are sufficient ca surface catchments, and groundwater doesn't have to follow them. But we do not know at the global scale what area contributes to um, fresh submarine groundwater discharge directly. So that's a first approximation. And we we'll model what happens in those catchments in order to be able to say how much SGD do we, fresh terrestrial SGD do we have. So what controls terrestrial fresh groundwater discharge? I thought I stay global and simplify and pull a Darcy. Um, so it's a classical, from a first order thinking, it's a classical Darcy. We see the statue of the famous Mr. Darcy looking down on us. Um, and it's basically his experiment um, that said the specific flow depends on a material property, which is hydraulic conductivity and a pressure difference between two locations. This is the very simple thing that we can think about. For in order to have fresh water flow, we need fresh water pressure difference, hydraulic conductivity of some kind, like either high or low or whatever. So it's different depending on what medium it flows through and area. Like the larger the area of that medium, the larger the flow. And then of course, at a global scale, we also kind of need recharge, which Mr. Darcy just assumed is there as much as he likes. But of course, in our case, if there's no water to recharge, we don't have groundwater discharge. I'm fairly sure. Um, so it looks very simple, but it's not simple at all. Um, and if you look at that figure from a recent uh, publication, it's not cited down there. It should be. Taniguchi uh, et al. 2019. Um, you see that um, there's lots of lots of processes that contribute to controlling terrestrial or SGD in general, but also terrestrial groundwater discharge. So the pressure difference, it's not that we have two constant pressure heads as Mr. Darcy assumed, but we have a temporarily changing pressure head on the land side, um, which is climatically driven, and we have a tide driven changing pressure head on the seaward side. So we have this kind of thing and the flow happens somewhere between that. Um, and then hydraulic conductivity is not Mr. Darcy, and we also assume the homogeneous body, but it's not homogeneous. We have preferential flow paths. We have crabs building their burrows at the, at the sea floor. We have roots. We have all kinds of, like hydraulic conductivity isn't trivial at all at these scales. But we have to, again, we have to simplify. Holly Michael, who will talk next, next month, and I'm really looking forward to that, did a lot about heter heterogeneity and its effect on flow. And then we have area. And area should be simple, you say, because area is something known. But at the global scale for coast, it's not at all simple. We do not know how deep our aquifers are. We do not know even how long our coastline is. It's a fractal problem. We do, there is no true coastal global, uh, global coastline. It can vary between, I think, about 400 kilometers and like 2 million kilometers, depending on the scale that you look at. Um, and then recharge, needless to say, that this is also not so trivial. Um, so it's a very complex problem. But for the global scale, we have to simplify. So we do. Um, and look at the problem as a 
as 2D cross-sections of individual watersheds. So if you think of all those red coastal watersheds that I showed previously, um, we would do, we would have a, um, a cross-section through that watershed and try to numerically model um, how groundwater flows in that cross-section. And again, that's mostly, or that's totally by Elko Leuendijk. So it's, I'm not the modeler here, this is his. Um, and they, um, so we have coastal watersheds represented by a t 2D cross-sections. We assume a homogeneous 100 meter thick aquifer and we take the parameters from global data sets. And then you see those, those cross sections, they have a slope, which would represent in a way on um, the hydraulic head. They have recharge, um, they have a permeability obviously, and then the water flows from the land towards the sea, that would be the coast, and goes out again. And up here, you see the fluxes. So that's recharge over there, and then right at the coast, that would be terrestrial near shore groundwater discharge, and that would be fresh submarine groundwater discharge. So both of them, um, and often, oftentimes they are combined in studies. So if you know other global scale SGD studies, they will probably combine those two into SGD. But that's a, something for later. So this is what we did. We did 350 of those models, of those, um, of those runs. And they are synthetic. So it's not a particular catchment that's being run, but it's a synthet synthetic combination of parameters of permeability, of topographic gradient, and of recharge. Because then, and each of, each of those black boxes would be one model run. And then you see the higher the permeability for a given topographic gradient, the higher the groundwater discharge. So the more blue, the more groundwater. Same here, for a given permeability, when the recharge is higher, then the groundwater discharge increases. So this is the way to read this figure. And the, at the back, you see the 40,000 coastal catchments that we have, and they are interpolated from the model ones that we have. Um, so what does that tell you? Or what does that, what did it kind of tell us is, um, the different, the importance of the individual parameters or the changing of behavior with individual parameters. You can see that here. So we do it for the parameters, watershed length, topographic gradient, recharge and permeability. Um, so for watershed length, you see that as, as soon as the watershed is longer than like 10 kilometers, in the model, under the given conditions, the, um, the SGD, which is here in blue, and the near shore discharge, which is here in green, they do not increase anymore. Which kind of makes sense because if you have very large catchments, they drain into river systems and not into SGD. Um, so this is this is kind of a nice result. And that gray shaded area in the back, this is the representation of the actual coastal watersheds. So most would be about 10 kilometers long that we have used. With the topographic gradient, um, it's a little bit more complex. You see, if it's very, if you have a very low gradient, very flat areas, according to the model, they don't produce a lot of SGD. And as soon as the gradient is above a certain threshold, it goes up. And then when it's very steep, it doesn't really help anymore. Um, with the um, near shore discharge, it looks a little bit different. It goes down at very steep gradients, which kind of makes sense because there's no, like it, the water really flows down worse then. Interestingly with recharge, it's a little bit, it's a little bit similar to the, um, to the watershed length. So as soon as you have a certain recharge, if you have no recharge, obviously there's no discharge too. But as soon as you have a certain recharge, for a given permeability, that watershed doesn't produce any more groundwater discharge because um, the aquifer just is not able to transport all that recharge. So it goes off as surface runoff. That was for us a little bit surprising to see, um, but it's similar to, to, Holly's, um, to Holly's results um, to that the um, that recharge actually is often not a limiting parameter, um, but it's more transport limited. With permeability, it's a little bit similar. 
um, you see that for very low permeabilities, you don't have groundwater discharge, makes sense. And then it suddenly goes up. So it was interesting also to see how the, uh, how the model behaves. And you have um, to keep in mind when I show you the global map next, that this is basically the map is the sum of those parameters. It's not measured groundwater discharge, but it's really only the sum of those parameters. Um, so this is how it would look like globally. Um, the amount of fresh SGD around the globe for those 40,000 catchments, the result of the extrapolation, basically. Again, long blue lines are a lot of groundwater discharge. Those shorter, lighter lines are less groundwater discharge. And those red dots, this is what we call hotspots, where we have quite some groundwater discharge um, also compared to river discharge. So in numbers, the global fresh SGD, according to the model, is 78 cubic kilometers per year, and the coastal groundwater discharge is 224 cubic kilometers a year. That's not too much, actually. It's less than 1% of river discharge, uh, and it's 13% of recharge in the catchments. That number to basically say, okay, most of the recharge goes out as surface runoff, um, and those 13% would end up on average as groundwater discharge. So the global number is, and I have to admit that, for me personally, lower than I would have liked it to be. Um, I would have loved to publish something where it's like 10% of global river discharge, and so important, and then, don't know, get a UNESCO importantly grant. I didn't, um, but that number, yeah, is is the number we came up with. We we, tr we tried to keep it to keep it high, basically, um, but it doesn't go much higher based on our um, based on our results. But what you can do with that map is differentiate also different regions. And now it gets interesting because if you, for instance, look at latitude you see that most of the fresh SGD is from tropical latitudes by far. And this is similar to results of Zoo et al from 2019. Um, by far, most of the SGD comes from a narrow band around the equator, which is really interesting um, for me. Also, there's lots of SGD is modeled in Iceland. I don't know if I, I, I personally don't know an, a fresh SGD study from Iceland. I'd be interested to see one. I won't go there, I have to work in the tropics, but um, this is because it's volcanic rocks, it's steep coasts, and it has a lot of, uh, a <clears> lot of, <throat> so volcanic rocks have a high map permeability, and that ends up to high groundwater discharge. If that's true, I can't tell you. This is also kind of the challenge of the model. Um, it's calibrated with global data. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not calibrated with Indonesian data, for instance. The permeabilities in Indonesia don't necessarily have to be exactly right. And with permeability, this is an important, an important factor. So there are some shortcomings in these simplifications, but nevertheless, I would say that the general patterns are most likely to kind of, to kind of work out. We also see like in in Japan, there are some areas with, areas with high SGD. In the Mediterranean, we know there's lots of SGD. In Indonesia, we also know there's lots of SGD. Um, so I would say the general patterns kind of work. But obviously, you need to evaluate these results somehow. This is the first thing when you do a global model, someone asks you to please compare to observations. Fair point. We tried that. Um, so that would be model results compared to observations for individual points. We tried to find studies that observed fresh groundwater discharge um, and then modeled the amount of groundwater dis uh, the amount of coastal groundwater discharge in that catchment and then tried to bring those two together. And what you see is everything should be situated on that one-to-one -one line. Then we would have a perfect fit. It kind of is not a perfect fit. Um, so the local estimates of fresh SGD have a tendency to be higher than the modeled uh, coastal groundwater discharge. There's just very few that are a little bit lower, most are higher. Um, and that's of course not so 
nice that I could I could use that result and say the model underestimates fresh SGD nearly everywhere. But we did another check and looked for um, the local estimates of fresh SGD versus groundwater recharge into those catchments. So the theoretical maximum our model could produce based on the recharge data that we have. Now it is closer to the one-to-one -one line, some are lower and some are higher, but still, um, still some are higher. That means they would have at this location, the, obse the observed fresh SGD is above the, um, the recharge into that catchment, which is highly unlikely. Um, I, would, I would expect that recharge, uh, that, that SGD is recharge minus surface runoff. So it should be way lower. Um, and this brings me to a point that really has, has been driving me for the last years and that I don't really have a solution for yet, that I think we have a disconnect between the local scale and larger scales, be it continental, global, however you want to name it maybe even regional. Um, so I'm not saying the local scale studies do anything wrong. They're excellent studies. I know them. We, we also have done some of them. They are less excellent than that what the others do. So everything, everyone does great work here, but it's not comparable because it, it works at such different scales. And this is, for me, a challenge that I would like to try to overcome, um, that we would produce local scales that work to compare against the global models. And on the other hand, also compare model, uh, produce models that are fine enough to really go down to the local scale. But that's a far way off, I can tell you. So um, the uncertainty of that global model is huge. Um, but in any way, we can use it for things. We can, for instance, use it to estimate eutrophication risk by fresh subwing groundwater discharge. Um, we do that by adding um, by adding solutes to um, or nutrient solutes to the groundwater discharge. The nutrients we get from a global database is also a very very simple approach. But you see that there's a comparably high eutrophication risk in some estuarine areas, but mostly salt marshes and coral reefs um, in those areas that are colored like they are. So like the coral reefs would be for instance, here in this sandy color, um, obviously mostly in the tropics too. So this is where it really gets interesting. And this is where we also can say people look, um, if you think about eutrophication, also think about groundwater discharge, particularly in those areas. And this does not say that every of those stripes, every of those areas is interpreted correctly, but there is quite some potential that should be looked at at a regional, at a local scale, where, we, where you really can depict things. Because groundwater discharge does have ecological consequences, for instance, at the local scale. We have seen that with other studies from our group, um, for instance, in Lombok in Indonesia, where it goes into a coral reef, and you clearly can see that things are happening in that coral reef. There's a beautiful spring right here. Um, so it affects the reef, it transports nutrients to the reef. We have seen in Tahiti and Mauritius, um, that groundwater discharge affects fish abundance and, 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 and health. And this is also a, this is an important thing. And this, is, this happens at the local scale. There are many other examples. There's been a beautiful review of Eliana Letcher in 2018, I think, where they are named. So um, this happens at the local scale. Those corals and those fish, they don't care for a global average. They care for their local system. And it's similar with social consequences of SGD um, that really fascinated me for quite some time now and still are fascinating. People use it. Um, people use it for drinking, for hygiene, for agriculture, etc. And also those usage cases, they don't care for a global average. They don't care if it's globally less than 1%. They care how it looks like at their specific place and at that specific time. Um, and this is why I would argue that Submarine groundwater or fresh terrestrial submarine groundwater discharge is um, globally, regionally relevant. <laughs> so um, there's around the globe, there's lots of regions where it's important. There's also regions where it's not so important, but there's a lot of regions where you should consider this effect. 
if you think about that a little bit more conceptually, you have the scales of effects on the y-axis in years in time, on the um, on the x-axis in in in, uh, in length in meters. Both are logarithmic. Um, you see that you have microbes, for instance, benthic microbiology. It cares for scales of less than a meter and very short times, less than a year, maybe. You have ecosystems, coastal ecosystems. They care about scales from meters to tens of kilometers and from days to maybe decades or millennia. You have things like United Nations Development Goals, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. They fit nicely in here because they care about scales from tens of kilometers to the global coastline um, and maybe from like years, years to centuries. That's their maximum effect. Then you have um, ocean, ocean chemistry that cares for larger scales and longer scales. And then you have paleo-oceanography and that even cares for much longer scales. So I think it's important to, to watch the scale or to keep in mind which scale things are relevant for. And maybe if, if the absolute water flux and the solid flux isn't too big, fresh submarine groundwater discharge as it is now is not too important for the ocean chemistry. But it certainly is important for some areas and sustainable development goals or for some coastal and many coastal ecosystems or microbiology. This is kind of the point I'm trying to make with this regional relevance. So towards the end, um, I, I thought a lot about comparability um, of studies of things that we do. Um, and I've recently seen the phrase that we are a mature research field now in the SGD community. Um, and I think it's time to think about our approaches in a very systematic way. Um, and this is again a figure from the Taniguchi paper of last year where scales are mentioned. We have temporal scales and vertical scales. And I would like to emphasize the vertical scale here. And this is 10 to the second. So this is 100 meters. And if you look at which techniques are used or can be used according to this graphic um, to estimate SGD as a, at a larger scale, and this is, this is total SGD. This is not just fresh, but with fresh is even more complicated. There's very few techniques that are applicable at larger scales. There's basically only mentioned the numerical models. So I know it wasn't intended to look at it exactly like that, but it kind of is, it, it's, it's, it's no way true. We have problems in, in large scale observations and I would really hope that we find something, something there. So there is a disconnect between those scales. And then there's a second thing I would like to talk about regarding comparability. While I have this beautiful audience of 96, of 96 um, people who are interested in SGD. Now I'm a bit, I, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm fine. 96 is a lot. Cool. Um, so 96 people. The a second thing I would like to talk about is all things discharge again. So you, you, you may have noticed my, my mixing up between fresh SGD and terrestrial SGD. Um, which is probably my fault, um, but there is things we we thought about this this thing that's called coastal groundwater discharge, which includes nearshore groundwater discharge. I think the nearshore has been forgotten or has not been considered a lot. Now the question is: Is it different than SGD? Wouldn't it could couldn't we just include it in SGD and just think it with it? And that then depends on what are the processes that you, that you look at. Do you think about, um, one thing I'm fascinated about in SGD is its influence on the benthic community because it comes from the bottom. Um, the near shore groundwater discharge wouldn't have that. So that it could be in some, sometimes it's different, sometimes it's not different. Then we have estuarine groundwater discharge. Again, a paper, uh, a figure from this beautiful 219 paper. Um, here you see a lot of groundwater going into an estuary. Is that SGD or is that not SGD? Um, if it's SGD, like in terms of water balance, it's not included in the river water balance. So it's, it's fresh SGD in, in that sense. But when I argue, which I like to do, 
that SGD is important because it delivers nutrients, not just at the river mouth, but also along the coast, then it's not SGD because this groundwater discharge would contribute to delivering nutrients at the river mouth. So it makes it complicated to, um, to think what it belongs to. Then I've read the term hydrothermal submarine groundwater discharge, which to me sounds very much like cold seeps. Um, and I'm, I, maybe, maybe I'm the only one, but I'm not exactly sure what the difference is. Um, and then we have pore water exchange and benthic fluxes, things that happen also at the coastal realm. And then sometimes they're differentiated, like, yeah, there's one is above one meter, the other is below one meter. Um, but in my opinion, it's, it's, it's very similar. And we need, to, we need to think about, better think about what we talk about. When I started in the field some years ago, I met a cast hydrogeologist. And, he's, and I explained what I do, and he said what he does. And he said, yeah, I'm working in, I'm working in springs in the Mediterranean Sea, underwater. And I said, ah, oh, cool, then you also do submarine groundwater discharge. And he was like, no, 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 I'm doing sub, I, I do submarine springs. Submarine groundwater discharge is only this diffuse stuff. Um, so in my opinion, if we want to reach clearer conclusions, um, we, we need to think about what do we think about. Um, so yeah, but with that reaching clear conclusions, I'd like to get to the conclusions. Um, and that's that fresh terrestrial SGD is regionally, is globally regionally important, as said. Little volume globally, but regionally really interesting. We see a strong eutrophication potential at many locations. And then those last two slides, I see a disconnect between the scales that we need to bridge. Um, and there's different types of groundwater discharge that are addressed similarly. And in my opinion, this impedes comparability regarding processes and relevance. So I would really encourage this beautiful audience here to, um, yeah, to, to work, to, to, to keep in mind that if there's more, more than submarine groundwater discharge happening at the coast. And there are a lot of communities that talk too little to each other and that could really benefit from each other. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention and I'm open for discussion. Well, thanks so much, uh, Niels. Um, it was an insightful presentation. Um, we are going to open up for questions. I think, can you see the Zoom uh, chat, Niels? We have a, a question or a comment from uh, Michael Bocher to start there. So Michael, do you want to develop uh, the question or everyone can read it? Or maybe Niels wants to talk a little bit about that. Hi Niels, do you want to answer? <laughs> uh, yes, of course. <clears throat> I love to answer your questions, Michael. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so the um, observed SGD versus modeled SGD, could that be due to a selection of databases? Um, certainly, um, because yeah, local, and you, you go on, and I think we agree to that, that local SGD studies tend to study SGD where they can see it, or where, where it is known. Um, and that produces a, um, that produces a, a strong positive bias. And this is also why, one of the main reasons I think that we can't use them at the regional scale. I forgot to actually mention that. Um, but I haven't yet found something that's really representative for the coast. And I'm trying while I talk to read the second part of the question, but that's too hard for me. I'm seeing, I'm not multitasking. I'm not a multitasking person. Yes, we need to, we need to consider the non-impacted reference areas too, but that's, yeah. And the coastal sediments data, that would be one of those areas that I haven't looked into and that might be beneficial to, to, to look into. Um, poor water chemistry, um, because I haven't seen, I think a single study that had the keyword submarine groundwater discharge, but said there's no submarine groundwater discharge here. So my, 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 my search for submarine groundwater discharge is very, gets limited and is also positively biased. So that would be a way to, to look at that. But I don't know that database yet. Yeah. 
um, or I don't know a database about those global, uh, those coastal sediments. So there's a half a second question there from Manish uh, asking about the Indian Peninsula. Why so little uh, SDG, but very high risk of eutrophication? You have any comments on that? And if the audience wants to jump in and comment on, on the topic, uh, yeah, feel free to raise your hands. Uh, hopefully via the group chat so you can call and you can try to keep this a little bit organized. Yeah. Um, so SGD along the Indian Peninsula is, um, is according to the maps fairly low, lower than I think it really is because um, the, um, the permeability in the Indian, in the Indian rocks at the in the global map is mapped fairly low. So the global map produces a low permeability for India or for many parts of India. Um, and therefore also um, the SGD is fairly low. I'm not sure this is the case. I know the Indians have a, a huge pro project currently going on to, um, to look at your SGD um, and fresh SGD. And I'd be really interested to, to, to see what comes out. Um, the eutrophication is higher than because um, there's higher, um, there's higher nutrient concentrations, plus um, I would guess, and it's just a guess, I would have to look into it, that also the river discharge in many areas of India isn't too high. And the eutrophication is, is a comparison between groundwater discharge and river discharge. And therefore I would guess that this plays into it, but for the individual locations, I will have to look into the data. Um, so if you like to discuss individual locations and check like why is it so low, I can tell you, but I need some time for that. So just send me emails. Um, and I'm sure in everyone's backyard, the map will be wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm assuring you. Um, so please don't be too hard with me if it's wrong in your backyard, but it might be, I think the general, the general direction should be, should be good. So Alicia had a, a comment. Uh, Alicia, do you want to turn on your microphone and talk a little bit about that, or is just a general comment? No, actually, I okay. I agree with uh, uh, Niels, and uh, uh, yeah, I like. Um, uh, actually, the our studies are showing that Bay of Bengal is uh, having a lot of eutrophication, actually, and uh, um, and mostly we feel that uh, the responsibility. Is uh, lies with the rivers uh, rather than SGD. So even if SGD is uh, not high, but uh, uh, rivers are responsible for main eutrophication. So here there is some kind of decoupling is happening, uh, or the uh, I mean some interesting features are there, and I believe that uh, we will be looking forward to it. And, uh, yeah, with our, uh, joint effort uh, by because we have the SGD uh, national uh, mission going on with uh, NSET. So probably we will find some answer uh, soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That'd be really cool. Thanks, Manish. And I, I really like the Mission SGD project. I think it's one of, the, one of the most interesting regional scale SGD projects, at least that I know of. Um, so I'm really looking forward to your results. So Alicia, do you want to jump in and talk about hydrothermal and uh, cold sips? Oh uh, yeah, that, that was really mostly, uh, oh, oh here, I can even turn on my video. It's still early here in the morning. Oh, um, <laughs> I wanted to say, oh, oh I was just do, uh, suggesting that, I think that's the difference between the hydrothermal and then the cold seeps. Hydrothermal really implies a volcanic heat source. Um, and cold seeps um, can come from compaction driven flow like in the Gulf of Mexico, or they can be associated with geothermal convection. Um, like you think about the co uh, Cohut's work in Florida, think about those are warm springs, but they're still kind of cold seeps um, and there's no volcanic source there. But that was mostly just a comment. I was getting started to write another question though. I wonder, Niels, what the anisotropy ratio was in your models. Um, I would have to check in the data. I, um, if you ask me, I think the ratio was ten, but I have I would have to check that. I can't I can't tell you from the top of my mind. 
Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Because one thing we've been finding is um, I have two papers in the um, that special issue of uh, water resources in JGR oceans that I finally managed to finish. And I don't know the, whether they'll be accepted on this round or when they'll ever come out. But um, we've been finding in our area uh, in South Carolina, where I noticed that the fresh groundwater discharge was estimated to be low. And I think that would probably be true regionally around in uh, the Southeastern United States. Um, but what we've been finding is that we have a lot of stacked confined aquifers and so having, an, and, and obviously we all know uh, hydrogeology, we never have homogeneous sediments down to 100 <laughs> meters. Um, yeah. But what I hadn't appreciated is how far that can move submarine groundwater discharge offshore when you have confined aquifers. We have a confined aquifer that starts at about 15 or 20 meters below sea level. And what it does is it connects to the seafloor 10 kilometers offshore. And fresh groundwater doesn't discharge out there. But what we find is we have tidal fluctuations and other things that happen out there that we hadn't, somehow we had just ignored. We thought all this tidal exchange and everything would be right near the coastline. But we're finding with these confined aquifers that it, it may actually be much farther offshore. Yeah. I, so that I was my seen... question. If you had anisotropy, that would spread the flow further offshore. But my experience yeah. with, um, with uh, homogeneous anisotropic models is that I didn't get flow much further than five kilometers offshore. Yeah, exactly. The, the model also, because it's homogeneous, it's only a few hundred meters or a few kilometers offshore that, that, we, get, that we get flow. In the, in the supplement, there's one graphic showing that it doesn't go too far. Um, but you're right, like, um, this is one thing I'm also really fascinated by is, yeah, those offshore swings that we don't know that they exist. I'm sure there are large swings offshore somewhere. And I would like to, I would really love to have someone finding them and spotting to them. Because there's always this, there's one famous thing, or for me famous from 1967, where offshore the US coast, some um, some uh, some diving craft lost buoyancy, and they said they would have oh, right. a, spring, a freshwater spring about 200 kilometers offshore in 500 meters depth. They said the only reason to lose buoyancy has to be freshwater. So yeah, if it's that if it's that far out, it would be really interesting to see where else we have submarine springs. This is Holly. Oh. Can I comment on that quickly? Yes, please. Mills, nice talk. This is Holly. I don't know if you heard. Um, I just wanted to to just comment on on what you were just talking about with the anisotropy, because in our models, um, we have some. Well, the heterogeneous models tend to be really anisotropic, um, and then when we simulate uh, equivalent homogeneous um, models that are highly anisotropic, we can get the freshwater existing way offshore and the SGD, the, the fresh groundwater discharging far offshore. Um, and I think it would also change your ratio of what's discharging, you know, just onshore versus offshore. Yeah, probably it would. I'm fairly sure. I'm also like between those two, um, I think it's highly uncertain the, the, the exactly that ratio between near shore groundwater discharge and um, and submarine groundwater discharge in that model. Um, it's based on the parameters that we choose. Um, so yeah, I'm not saying it's exactly as it is. Well, yeah, so I'm going to imply you were wrong. I'm just saying that that's an interesting tuning parameter for, you know, if you're trying to make the comparisons to data and things like that, that that could be a factor. I think in the in the appendix of the of the paper and the electronic supplement, there's also a figure doing exactly that and looking at different anisotropic ratios on um, how they affect the individual flows. But I would have to look that up. Thanks, Neil. So we have a question from Sarah. So moving a little bit away from this um, heterogeneity conversation in offshore ground. So Sarah uh, is asking about eutrophication. Uh, 
comparing your model to existing data. Uh, do you want to build on that, Sarah? Do you want to jump in, or you want to let uh, Nils uh, talk about that? Uh, yeah, it was a pretty simple question, and my apologies, I haven't actually read the paper, but um, I was just wondering whether there's there's scope to compare your your eutrophication potential um, with existing, say, riverine or um, marine nutrient concentration databases. We haven't yet. Um, we haven't looked into um, into marine concentration data. Um, also, we haven't looked into SGD um, nutrient concentration data at that point. What we showed there is purely basically nutrient concentration estimates in the fresh groundwater on land and then um, times groundwater flux. Um, so it's a very simple approach to just highlight the potential, but yeah, there's a lot of things. There's also the subterranean estuary between. So it's not, I'm not saying that this is what will end up there. And we also couldn't do that at the global scale yet. So that would, it, that would require a whole lot of work that's very different from the one that was put in the model. Looks like a great opportunity to keep building on that news and uh, maybe somebody to collaborate with you to, to further build the model. Huh? Yes, please. Yeah. So looks like we have another question from Suresh. Uh, Suresh is talking about the tectonic disturbances on SDG. Yes. Uh, Suresh, do you want to build on the question or should you let Niels talk about that? Uh, thank you, I said. Um, Niels, the presentation was extremely good. You were uh, scaling up from local to regional to global. You know, it, it did, uh, you know, conveyed the, the impact and the, uh, you know, the uh, contribution in different parts. So in that context, you know, you have shown that around Indonesia and all that, uh, the SDD flux is very high. So do you consider this uh, tectonic aspects in the, in the calculation while scaling up? We, we, we haven't included tectonics in there. They, um, as far as I know, there is, I don't know of a global data set of basically tectonic, there is global stress data and stuff, but it's difficult to translate into groundwater pathways because what tectonics would, in my mind, does mainly is produce or change, um, change permeability on the one hand, maybe by compression, but on the other hand, also, of course, produce preferential flood pathways like fault systems where groundwater can migrate through. Um, and we don't have that. The, um, the lithology component or the, basically the material component is only rock type and that rock type gets a permeability assigned. And that permeability is globally the same. So a volcanic rock in the US would get the same permeability as a volcanic rock on Tahiti and on Indonesia. Um, so this is kind of also the, one of the shortcomings regionally that obviously those um, permeabilities are different also because of tectonic influences. And this is something the, the, the model doesn't yet represent. Yeah, maybe, you know, the limestone, for example, limestone could be different in different parts and the interconnectivity and the, the amount of uh, secondary porosity develop, even though oh, yes. the lithology is same, they also have an impact. Uh, yes, absolutely, they, they do. But again, the database on global scale is very limited regarding that. And especially for limestone, you're totally right. The permeability range is huge. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, Nils. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. So uh, we have no more questions in the group chats. Uh, anybody wants to jump in and ask a question, uh, either via the group chats or just turn on your microphone and say something. <laughs> Nils, I'll throw a question while people are thinking. Uh, what about uh, the parameters that you use as inputs in the model? Which specific parameter do you feel like you really have to, to keep developing and get some more detail uh, at that global scale? Is there a specific uh, to keep developing? 
I think permeability is the main the main issue here, or the material properties in general. As Suresh mentioned, the tectonics we don't have that um, heterogeneity in any way. We we don't have that um, multiple aquifer layers. We also don't have that. So I think the material properties are not well represented yet. But at the same time, this is also oh, this is some I'm I'm I like building global data sets. Um, and this is something I regularly do. But yeah, representing regional scale um, material properties of rocks on aquifers at the global scale is really a challenge because for many locations, we don't have those data. For the US, it's beautiful. For Europe, it's okay. But for many other regions, it's really difficult to get hands on them or they don't exist at all. All right, do we have more people uh, raising their hands, asking questions to Niels? Um, anybody else wants to pick his brains? I just want to chime in again, this is Alicia, that this is really nice work and it really answers some important questions. So thank you so much for the talk. You're very welcome. I agree, Alicia, that's really pushing the field forward and that closes some questions and opens so many more. Feels like uh, uh, this paper uh, and this work uh, really should keep news busy for the next 10 years, huh? If, uh, yeah, I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Please help me improve it or improve it without me. Just, you know, there's, there's lots to do around that, I would say. There's room for improvement and plenty of it. So there you go, Niels. There is another question popping up there from Erwin Rakasa, um, talking about Germany coastal peatlands. Uh, Erwin, do you want to jump in and develop that, or should we give uh, Niels the words? I go ahead. No problem. Um, yeah, northern Germany. Um, we are very flat. We have um, low hydraulic conductivities. Um, and so, yeah, would I expect the main factor to be preferential pathways? Kind of. Um, I mean, something we see is that in Germany, we have very few, uh, very few significant, like really big sites of SGD. Um, and other parts of the world have much more SGD, much bigger springs, etc. So we do have fresh terrestrial submarine groundwater discharge, but not too much of it. So this kind of goes, this aligns well with the low, um, the low topography and the low permeability. Um, but we also don't have too much like tectonic activity. So the preferential pathways are also limited or bound to individual structures. So in, for instance, in, in Zahlenburg, we find a very interesting thing that you have a confined aquifer below a, a sort of, um, shaley area and there it pushes through every now and then and then you get those springs um which are mobile and which go through a power sediment so that would be a preferential pathway situation where it's something maybe it was a lug worm or something that dug a hole and the hole became a spring um so i would say i would say yes probably it's mostly preferential pathways but we also see regions in the Baltic Sea, for instance, where the permeability isn't so low. But it's a, re it's a very local thing every time. Okay. It's a very local thing what's dominating. Okay. So Niels, Natasha has a very difficult question for you. Uh, Natasha, unmute and ask the question to Niels. Uh, Niels, this was really, really nice um, paper put together with all the conversations we had in the last, I would say, five years. So um, really difficult question, as Isaac said. Um, how would the magnitude of SGD change with climate change on global scale? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting question. Um, it's easy to answer because I don't have to give numbers. Is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I would really think Find what I would think is interesting is to let like global global change or climate change has two implications for me right now. We have a change in recharge and we have a change in sea level. Um, these are the two primary components that I would think of right now. 
um, the change in sea level, so theoretically sea level goes up, groundwater level stays the same, we have less gradient, less flow. Um, it's as simple as that, theoretically, again, but um, also kind of the groundwater discharge or the groundwater level should adjust to the sea level and then maybe the effect isn't as big. So I would say sea level change also at the, at the speed that it's predicted, like we are in millimeters per year, I would guess it shouldn't have too much of an effect, but I would love to see a study trying that out. Um, and then the second is recharge. Recharge patterns will change, um, but as far as I know, um, Groundwater, at least precipitation, is supposed to go up a little. I don't think groundwater discharge, uh, groundwater recharge at global scale will do go down so much. So I would guess um, that the global magnitude of groundwater discharge will not change too much. I would fresh terrestrial groundwater discharge. Um, I would guess the the regional distribution will change. But the total, the total amount shouldn't be that different. I would, I would guess it stays within our uncertainties that we have anyway. Um, <laughs> so. OK, thank you. There you go, Niels. You have another comment from Prakash. So Prakash, talking about the coast of India, do you want to turn on your microphone and ask the question, Prakash? Yeah, uh, Dr. Niels? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, I have one small doubt. Uh, last uh, our presentation also we had discussed about the eutrophication, high eutrophication in peninsular in India. I hope uh, it may be the recirculated HGD. Even uh, I got some uh, flags as a recirculated. Uh, I find out that through radon. So is any other techniques to find out the recirculated HGD other than radon? I mean, there's, there's, there's other experts than me sitting right under my, under my picture right now. Um, but I, I'm more the fresh person, but I would say that um, there is, you can, you can use other tracers, but radon probably or radium would be a classical tracer. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I'm seeing your thumbs up. I'm doing well here. Um, <laughs> um, so radium would be a good tracer too. Um, yeah, yeah. But, so I'm, I'm asking other than ge uh, geochemical tracers. Ah, other than geochemical, that'd be tricky. Um, you could try to actually model it. Um, I don't think the temperature effect will be huge. So I think you will mostly have to rely on geochemistry, but please any of those 78 remaining persons, if you have a better tracer than geochemistry or another good tracer, please answer it. Um, Anybody wants to jump in and help Prakash with a nice answer about how to do state line SGG? All right, so this it's uh, two o'clock time. We have started one hour ago. I think you're gonna close here. Uh, thanks so much, Neil. It was such a nice presentation, so insightful, so much stuff happening there. Uh, yeah, it was nice to see so, so many familiar faces and it's actually interesting to realize how big uh, the SDG community has, has become. Uh, so many of us thinking about that, and uh, I didn't think there were so many people who would be interested in the topic. So uh, thanks, everyone, for engaging. We will have another talk in a month uh, from uh, Holly Michael. She'll be talking about uh, groundwater flows and carbon cycle in salt marshes. Um, I'll be sending an email reminding everyone maybe about a week before her talk. It's scheduled for the 24th of June. And we'll keep trying uh, doing that uh, every month or so. So uh, yeah, thanks again. Uh, I'm going to keep 